recommended to us. Uh, Mr. Mark Laubacher uh, received his degree in nursing from Capital University, his RN from The Ohio State University, um, has worked as a full-time nurse at the Children's uh, Department at the Na Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, and works for the uh, Center, Central Ohio Poison Center. Is that correct? Yes. Close enough? Okay. Close enough. <laughs> He's also a faculty member at Grant Medical Center in the paramedic program. And he will be speaking to us tonight on Hospital of Firsts, the first uh, U.S. Navy hospital ship. So, marvelous. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. Thank you for that warm introduction while we're getting uh, loaded here. And are we able to bring up the slides for the audience? Uh, while we're doing that, if uh, I brought with me a copy of the abstract is uh, for tonight's presentation, as well as the objectives. I also have the bibliography, uh, uh, the references, if you would, uh, if you need those. So I have additional copies. Uh, sir, can we bring up the slides? Uh, for those that are joining us remotely, uh, the, uh, the first slide here will have my contact information. So if you need the uh, copy of the abstract and or the bibliography, you can uh, send me a text message on my cell number there that's posted or write down my email address. The same slide will be at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, so you have that, uh, if you don't have that uh, be able to see that at this moment. So tonight's presentation, USS Red Rover, a hospital of first, is going to examine the very first uh, naval hospital um, ship, naval, ho uh, na naval ship, uh, in, uh, working as a hospital. And also, uh, technically, it was the uh, it actually, you'll find out tonight that it actually belonged uh, to the Union Army. Do we have any hockey fans in the audience tonight? I know, I know we have, I have one, two, three, quite, quite a few, quite a few, excellent. Uh, so I'll, I, I often incorporate um, trivia questions with my uh, presentation. I have thousands of dollars in cash and prizes here. <laughs> uh, I would choose not to have to like pack those up and haul them home. So feel free to uh, uh, to win some uh, some prize money. Um, so if you're not aware, Columbus in the year uh, 2000, so 21 years ago, became a major league city. Of uh, the four uh, major sports, football, baseball, basketball, and hockey, uh, Columbus now has a hockey team. And if you're not aware, we're known as the Columbus Blue Jackets. And for until uh, a few years ago, we actually competed against uh, in the against the uh, this team in here in the town. Um, <laughs> The Blackhawks. We tried to compete against them. Uh, anyway, uh, does anyone know how the team gets its name? Yes, sir. That is correct, but um, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Your dissertation is accurate, but that's the incorrect rationale, sir. And hence the reason why I take pleasure in stopping this perpetuated error. Okay. Uh, many people feel, yeah, they were named after uh, 
an Indian chief by the name of Blue Jacket. And in fact, when the internet was in its infancy, the scribes for the media, when it was announced that the team was going to be Blue Jackets, uh, was searching feverishly in the coming hour after that announcement, and they came up, they actually thought it was uh, to honor uh, Blue Jacket. And it's actually designed to honor and recognize Ohio's contribution to the Civil War, and even more specifically, Columbus's contribution as well. There is actually a gentleman in the audience who uh, is aware that Columbus had no fewer, actually there's two gentlemen in the audience know this, and the rest of you are going to be informed now, but uh, during the war there was no fewer than three businesses in Columbus that made, manufactured the Union sack coats for the infantry. Hence the name Blue Jacket. Our alternate jersey, this is the crest of such, and in the arena is a replica of an 1857 smoothbore Napoleon, and that gun, that cannon gets fired at the beginning of each home game, and also uh, following uh, when the Jackets pot a goal, which is quite frequently. Um, but so that's the, our other crest here. So now you're in the know, sir. But the excellent uh, dissertation there on uh, the gentleman blue jacket. I thought I was going to give away thousands of dollars in cash and prizes. <laughs> uh, just to show of hands really quickly, uh, anyone here uh, in the in the audience uh, hear the story of this this ship? Red Rover. Outstanding. So I take great pride in going to uh, roundtable gr groups across the nation. I've been as far west as uh, St. Louis, as far north as uh, um, uh, the Twin Cities in uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul roundtable group, as far south as th three of the organizations in Florida, uh, as well as uh, a couple of presentations in New Orleans, um, far east as our colleagues in Delaware. And my four canned presentations, um, uh, I discovered that people are tired of hearing about battles and leaders and leaders and battles. So I'm going to share with you some minutia. All four of my presentations have some sort of medical component to them, uh, hence my, uh, my interest in that. So here's the uh, ship that we're going to study tonight. Uh, this is the Red Rover. Um, for those that you th that are, uh, this is the bow of the ship, and we're staring at the starboard side. So for you landlubbers, that would this would be the front, and this would be the right, and uh, the back is the stern, and on the other side is the port. The easy way to remember that is the word left and port each have four letters, and right and starboard those letters are longer. Uh, then left and, and port, uh, starboard and right. So easy way to remember that. So the, at the onset of the war, operating on brown water in the Western theater, up and down the Mississippi and on the Ohio, um, was the Western gunboat flotilla and mortar fleet. And it was operating in concert with the Union Army. It was under, operating un, uh, under the War Department. And in the middle of March of 1862, there was a battle uh, called Battle of Island Number 10. The Confederacy sent ships up to this island and to try and stop and impede uh, this gunboat flotilla from coming down and taking uh, Memphis and then sailing on down and taking Vicksburg. Farragut and his crew were coming up uh, from the south and would take New Orleans. Um, but Farragut, as many of you were, are aware, did not like brown water. He was operating on blue water. And he was a Navy guy, and he wanted to be out on the, in the marine area. But uh, anyway, uh, 
the Battle of Island Number Ten, the many ships for the Confederacy were um, destroyed, sunk, and subsequently captured. And likewise, the Confederate state ship Red Rover was captured on April seventh. And trivia question: uh, April seventh of eighteen sixty-two. And the trivia question is: What's also significant about that date? Second uh, day of Shiloh. Very good. Um, the Red Rover was a floating barracks for the Confederacy. And so the sailors for the Confederacy would stay on Red Rover and operate artillery that was on um, a floating, uh, a fl a floating uh, battery. And that battery was actually called the, the ship or the, basically a glorified raft was called uh, New Orleans. Island number 10 is uh, situated uh, near New Madrid, uh, Missouri, on the Mississippi River. Uh, here's, a, here's where it sits. And this big loop that you see uh, was that bottleneck, and that's what I, uh, where the Confederacy identified as basically a way to slow down the uh, flotilla from com coming, uh, coming south. Also, if you're not aware, uh, island number 10 is part of, is, is basically where Tennessee's at. So this line um, goes right across. So below my pointer there is Tennessee. Up here is Kentucky. This area in the middle is all uh, Missouri. And then there's a line going across, and this is Tennessee. Uh, interestingly, even to this day, this area right here belongs to Kentucky. Uh, next trivia question, how does island number 10 get its name? It's the 10th island south of Cairo. Exactly correct, sir. You win a prize. Give it up for him, folks. Okay, that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. Uh, so yeah, so uh, as aids to navigation, the islands on, along the Mississippi River, starting with the confluence of the majestic Ohio, joining at the confluence there, the mighty Mississippi, at those islands south of that point, were identified by numbers to aid in navigation. And when you count down island number 10, it, it, that, that, that's the 10th island. But actually that's not, wasn't very useful uh, in part because he pictured here, there's an island there and does, it does not have a name nor a number. And, but here is island number nine above island number 10 and you can see over on the far right, uh, excuse me, far left is island number 11. There were even some islands that did not have numbers but had proper names. But nonetheless, they were there to aid navigation. Some other problems with it, it would be like, you could be difficult to spot an island when you're sailing at, uh, during the nighttime hours because there's no street lamps, there's no fires sitting there, and you could easily sail past one of those islands and or, and or get lost in your counting and maybe doze off and say, hey, where are we at? Oh, we're at nine. Uh, or was it 11? <laughs> oh, shoot. Uh, in total, there was actually, at the time, there were 125 islands, the last one being just north of Vicksburg. Also comes into play uh, time of year, because if there's a lot of water, uh, the water, the river is high, you could actually obscure a couple islands. And if the water is really low, maybe some islands would appear. So hence, it wasn't quite... Um, it wasn't perfect. Um, island number 10, uh, because of erosion and the river, if you're not aware, is always moving, uh, not just with flow, but it's changing boundaries and its banks. Island number 10 uh, is barely, barely visible to this day. It, and that's hence why, so the Confederacy sailed all those ships up there to block that river, those were, and to prevent that, uh, cause that bottleneck for that battle. And, uh, but it did not work because the gunboat Fultilla laid waste to the Confederate ships, uh, so much so that Harper's Weekly uh, uh, illustrated that the, the significance of that battle in their uh, publication on May 3rd of 1862, uh, taking uh, all the, taking the, the island and actually more specifically the ships. So this is all the wreckage at the top there of the Confederate ships. Uh, that were laid waste um, during, um, excuse me, March. Red Rover took a shell through all three decks 
and was taking on water in the Confederacy, uh, basically abandoned it and stuck it on the side of, uh, on the banks of the Mississippi, and you can see it sitting there uh, with the Red Arrow. Many of these ships were, would be uh, refloated, in, including Red Rover, and put back and become part of um, the flotilla and eventually the Navy for federal forces. A assistant quartermaster, an army captain by the name of George Wise, pictured here and again on the steps of the picture on the left, he saw this ship and re recognized that it's a floating hotel. It was a floating barracks for the Confederacy. And he says, well, how about if we make this a, ho a hospital? We're going to change it from a hotel to a hospital. And so that was he proposed that idea, and he was granted, so, and then subsequently supervised the conversion of Red Rover into a hospital ship. They refloated the ship, uh, sailed it up to uh, St. Louis, and for the, for the next two next two months, would fit it out and turn it into a hospital ship. So much so that uh, Foot, when he gave, granted uh, Admiral Foot granted his permission, gave him the final blessing. He said, "Yeah, indeed, proceed with all possible dispatch to St. Louis to procure a good, comfortable steamer to be fitted up as a hospital boat, with a surgeon, steward, etc., complete." And this was a month later, on May 10th of '62. Actually, it had already been up. You know, they already sailed it up uh, or towed it up to uh, St. Louis. Uh, so there's the picture of the ship. Again, that's the starboard side we're looking at um, with its two stacks. Uh, you can see the what's actually the main deck here. It's rather open. You're like, is that, that's not wreck it, or it's not going to take on water there. Uh, this ship was originally was built in 1859, and it was used as a merchant ship. It would sail up and down the Mississippi River uh, carrying stores, livestock, poultry, um, and then the uh, Confederacy used it a little bit for such, but it's more importantly, it was uh, for the Confederacy, it was that floating barracks. The Federal forces will still use it as the same, uh, transporting cattle and po live poultry uh, up and down the Mississippi River during its time, in addition to medical stores, as well as the upper decks uh, being part of the hospital. So here's the theater of operations. This is the brown water in the rest Western theater. Um, I'll highlight a couple areas for you. Uh, so at the top here, the red dot, uh, that's where uh, St. Louis is at. And the Mississippi River going, getting down to Cairo. It's Cairo, Illinois, not Cairo, Egypt, but it's Cairo. Uh, and that's the confluence there. And the Mississippi River is fairly straight. Um, and I'll give you some mileage as we move on on how long it takes this vessel or in any vessel at the time sailing up and down from, from point to point. The, red, the yellow dot there just to the east of the confluence is Mound City, Illinois, where there would be a Mound City Hospital that will be basically it's going to be the home base for Red Rover during its four year uh, lifetime. The yellow arrow, or excuse me, the red arrow there is where island number 10 is at. And Memphis will fall on June 6th, and it will have multiple hospitals on its banks uh, for uh, care of the sick and wounded uh, federal forces. Red Rover will be involved in, uh, in events on the White River, the Arkansas River, and even partake in the capture of Vicksburg. Uh, Prior to my presentation here, there was uh, there's uh, uh, going to be uh, a, an excursion of this very group going down to the Red River uh, in, uh, in in two years' time. Uh, Red the uh, Red Rover will be part of that Red River excursion. A uh, young gentleman by the name of Bailey is going to make some locks, and Red Rover will while it does not go sail up the Red River. It, sta it is stationed at the, on the Mississippi River. Likewise, it does not sail up the Arkansas River nor the White River. It always stays on the, uh, on the Mississippi. And eventually, after Vicksburg Falls, uh, Red Rover will make it all the way even down to New Orleans. 
This uh, zooming in a little bit, I realize this is quite busy, but uh, again, I'll highlight some things here for you. The, uh, there's the, the blue circle, and up at the top is St. Louis. Uh, there's Cairo, uh, Illinois. Um, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson on the Cumberland and Tennessee River. So uh, Grant, and in conjunction with that Western gunboat flotilla, will take Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson in February of 1862. They sail down, and then they sail back up and take, uh, go back down the Cumberland River to help take Fort Donaldson. Island number 10 there pictured. The massacre at Fort Pillow you'll hear about tonight. The Red Rover was instrumental in caring for uh, the injured at that, uh, that event. And again, it's basically what I would consider its second home base being Memphis. Uh, at the bottom there, the Tennessee River uh, signifies Shiloh. Uh, Foots uh, will eventually send down uh, two gunboats, the Tyler and the Lexington, in my opinion, it is those two ships that save the federal forces between on the evening of night, the first night, and into the second day. Uh, because that evening, if you're not aware, those two gunboats provided constant shelling to keep the Confederacy back. Uh, my opinion is that if they weren't there, um, the federal force, the Union, would have been annihilated on the morning of day two. So here's our ship. Uh, this is not part of it on, on the port side there. There's a, it's actually a coal barge. Uh, so the ship would take on, uh, need to take on coal, but you can get a better idea again. Uh, livestock on that first deck, and then the hospitals on decks two and three. She was uh, accordingly remodeled in her cabin arrangements and complete outfit of beds, bedding. Uh, furniture, sanitary stores, medical dispensary, etc., supplied by the commission. The services of surgeons and apothecary, steward, and nurses were engaged. The Western Sanitary Commission contributed $3,500 to help uh, supply the ship with medical supplies. Uh, a, uh, for those not aware, an apothecary is a pharmacist. So some specifications about uh, this delightful vessel. It's a side wheel wooden steamer, just under 800 tons. Uh, its length is 256 feet, so if you were to incorporate that into a football field, that's 85 yards uh, long. Uh, width is 41 feet, or about uh, 15 yards wide. And it sat in the water when fully loaded, eight feet. Uh, because it has two side wheels, although we only see one side wheel at a time, uh, it has two engines, one for each side wheel that is powered by five boilers, and these boilers are burning 38 bushels of coal per hour. Uh, when I was a young lad, my maternal grandmother would take us uh, peach to peach orchards and apple orchards, and we carried a bushel, bushel basket, a lightweight wooden basket, it was not lightweight for long uh, because then I had to haul it back to the car and it was quite heavy and I wasn't allowed to throw the apples into the basket. I had to daintily lay them in there so they would not bruise. Uh, but to illustrate, well, how much is a bushel hold? A bushel holds eight gallons of water uh, and we're burning 38 per hour of these bushel baskets. It had a top speed of nine knots, averaged about five. So, uh, so for you landlubbers, that would be uh, 10 miles per hour and uh, top speed and six miles per hour on the average. So it's a lot, it goes a lot faster when it's going downstream. Uh, it's going a lot slower when it's going upstream. Uh, also, it goes a lot slower upstream and when the water level is low. Um, Oh, and, and even goes faster in, uh, when the water level is high, so the spring runoff it was able to go a lot faster, uh, reach those max speeds of 10 miles per hour. Um, I will help you out uh, when I give the mileage. We'll just add, you know, we'll uh, subtract a zero, uh, and that'll let you know how many hours it would take to go from city to city. And I'll help you figure, I'll help you out with that. Uh, it was op under the operation of 12 officers with a uh, complement of 25 crew members, and then the medical staff was on the side. Uh, on any given day, there would be 30 medical officers or medical uh, 
uh, personnel there, and sometimes that number would go as high as 40. It did have uh, some armament to it. Uh, small arms for the sailors, the, the crew of 25 had their own small arms, and it, act, it also had a 32-pound uh, gun on its bow. The ship was supplied with everything necessary for the restoration to health and, of sick and disabled seamen. So bear, let's make out a little bit of the, about the 32-pound uh, the gun. There at the bottom is uh, what it would, uh, it would actually would have looked like, a 32-pound gun on its carriage. Uh, so quite, quite large, and while during its lifetime as a hospital ship, it never fired that weapon in, co in combat. I'm confident that they fired it in, as practice. There were two times when they came under fire, and they actually ch uh, loaded the gun, uh, but, did not, uh, but did not fire the, the weapon. As far as accommodations, she has bathrooms. Laundry, an elevator for the sick from the lower to the upper deck, an amputating room, nine different water closets, gauze blinds to keep uh, to the windows to keep the cinders and smoke from uh, annoying the sick, two separate kitchens, one for the sick, one for the well, a regular corps of nurses, and two water closets on every deck. So this ship is much different than what was uh, known as hospital transport ships. Hospital transport ships uh, were operating in the Western Theater, uh, taking uh, wounded and sick uh, from the battlefield to hospitals. Uh, there was quite a number of them. Some of you may know some of their names, one like the DA January. They were, hot, they were basically water ambulances. There was no medical care, there was no physicians, no surgeons on board those ships and hence why they did, were not classified as hospital ships. They were uh, hospital transport or hospital transport ships, not a hospital ship uh, because it did not have uh, physicians on board. So it's June, uh, June 10th of 1862, uh, just two months after it uh, is fitted out in St. Louis, and we're underway. On board are two surgeons, acting assistant surgeon George Bixby, and his colleague George Hopkins. They are actually both from Boston, but they never met each other until they set uh, foot on the ship. Uh, for those of you not aware, some of you may see in your readings, you see surgeon in the, la in the name, assistant surgeon in the name, and then you see acting assistant surgeon in the name, and what's all this mumbo jumbo about? At the start of uh, the war, if a physician, a medical doctor, was part of the union, or as part as the, uh, the Army or the Navy, although the Navy was very small, they, that uh, medical doctor had the title of either acting surgeon, or a, a, yeah, a assistant surgeon, or just surgeon. Once the hostilities started, the medical doctors who became part of the, um, the regiments or in this case, on ships, had the title acting, which means that basically they came from civilian life. Um, so they're going to put in their 90 days or their three months, and then after that they would be free to go. Many of them will stick around. In fact, George Bixby will stay, spend his entire, uh, be with the Red Rover during its entire lifetime during the war. There would be an additional six surgeons who would serve aboard uh, Red Rover. I'll show you some of their pictures later. Uh, but when it was fully loaded and ready to go, it could stay on the brown water for up to three months and so have uh, enough stores and provisions for the crew, uh, medical supplies for 200 patients, as well as provisions for 200 patients. It also had the capacity to carry 300 tons of ice. 300 tons, I have a hard time picturing that, but um, let me help you out. Uh, some of you probably purchased milk in a one-gallon conta plastic container. And to get to 300 tons of ice, one would need 87,000 of those one-gallon milk jugs. Put it another way. Let's bring in a container and let's build a container that is 10 feet long, 
10 feet deep and 10 feet high and fill it with water and freeze it. I need 11 of those. That is 300 tons of ice. People often ask me, they say, where did this ice come from and how, why didn't it melt? Well, it takes a long time to melt a solid block of ice like that. And there were ice stores. It was, a, it was an industry up in, the, up in north and up in Canada bringing ice down uh, for, to keep um, meat cold and preserve it without having to add salt to it. Uh, so this, that's how they obtained that uh, and why it worked uh, magnificently. So here's uh, George Bixby and George Hopkins, our two doctors. Again, it will be Bixby who will serve the entire uh, four years, the remaining uh, years of the war on the ship. Hopkins will leave at some point in time toward the end. And I said uh, at one point in time, the uh, home base for Red Rover would be Mound City. So here's Mound City on the right of the screen. On the left of the screen is the confluence of the Mississippi and Ohio there at Cairo. And Cairo will be a naval depot uh, for this Western gunboat flotilla and eventually become the uh, deep, uh, naval depot uh, when the gunboat flotilla ceases to exist and becomes part of the Navy. The name will just change to the Mississippi River Squadron. Um, this area between Cairo and Mound City is eight nautical miles. And again, so if the Red Rover is traveling uh, somewhere between 5 and 10 miles per hour, it's going to take one hour just to go from Cairo to Mound City. Let me zoom in a little bit for you on, at Mound City. Uh, there's the hospital there pictured, uh, and there's a corresponding railroad right next to it, uh, the, uh, 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 Illinois Central, to take away and return soldiers back home who are no longer f able to fight in the war um, from, from their injuries. That Mount City Hospital was started by uh, sisters uh, of the Immaculate Conception based out of Notre Dame. Um, and there's a picture of the a sketch of the building. Uh, there at the bottom right is the actual building itself. This building uh, in the picture here, it says Mount City Furniture Company. That building had multiple different owners in its lifetime, multiple different businesses going on. And as you can tell, at one point in time, it was a furniture hospital, or excuse me, a furniture company. In the front, a foreground there is just lumber to make all the furniture. So the river is behind that building. Red Rover had assorted uh, firsts, uh, one of which was the incorporation of non military personnel hired to assist and care for the injured and wounded. And they actually even worked, had other jobs and were on, were on other vessels of the Western Gunboat Flotilla, uh, which hired and paid civilian women. And aboard on the payroll of Red Rover during its lifetime uh, were nine known women. They had salaries uh, ranging from 10, uh, 7, 10, 15, as high as $20 per month. A lady by the name of Ann Graves, she was hired in April of 1862. Um, when the Red Rover was getting fitted out as a hospital ship, she was originally had the title of chambermaid, and she was earning twelve or excuse me twenty dollars per month, and she gets one ration of food per day. Other positions on Red Rover, in addition to chambermaid, were nurse and laundress, uh, because we had dirty laundry that needed to be cleaned. Now, keep in mind, the word, term nurse is a lot different today than it was at this time period. You, your presenter tonight is in that nursing profession, and his gender only accounts for 7% of that population. At this time period of the Civil War, the males outnumbered it was, uh, dramatically. They were in the majority of, that, of the nursing profession. Um, so sometimes that word nurse does not mean they actually had uh, education uh, that would might have been just a title to aid comfort to the sick and uh, injured. So men, male nurses outnumbered the female, and aboard Red Rover, uh, that's what uh, that was uh, included as well. Keep in mind, Ann Graves gets twenty dollars a month, 
where the Union Infantry, uh, each member was getting $13 a month and a day's ration. So it's June 10th, and it set sail, and on its first, uh, next day, we re it will receive the Red Rover, its first patient. His name is David Sands. He comes over from the USS Benton, which is the flagship of the flotilla, and he's suffering from a bout of cholera. Uh, four more will be admitted to the ship, to the hospital that day, and the next day, 13. And in four days' time, now word the census is up to 56. What had happened was word got out among the sailors of the flotilla that there's a floating Hilton on the uh, Mississippi River, and if you're sick, just tell somebody and they're going to take you over there. The medical officers and the captains of the ships of the flotilla that had sick sailors on them. They wanted to get them off the, sh off the ship, you know, so they didn't have to care for them. Let's let somebody else do it. And very rapidly, by the 15th, uh, it was determined that, you know what, the Red Rover is going to be, it's going to be full just from people wanting to come, come aboard. And so the word got, the order came down that if you have sick sailors on board, you need to try your best to care for your own sick. Uh, we will certainly take the wounded aboard Red Rover. We will take your very ill aboard the Red Rover. But for people that have hangnails, and maybe about a diarrhea, you need to take that care of that on your own. The ship had all the conveniences of, and appliances of a hospital are fully provided, and to these are added the neatness and order essential to such large an establishment. That was uh, our quartermaster wise. On June 17th of 62, Red Rover will indeed take its first trauma patient. In fact, it's going to take multiple that uh, will be admitted to the hospital. USS Mound City uh, will suffer a boiler explosion. And incidentally, it was the Mound City that actually captured Red Rover back there during that Battle of Island Number 10. Red, uh, Mound City would be involved in an expedition up the St. Charles, uh, or excuse me, at St. Charles, Arkansas on the White River. And it sustained a shell, penetrated the decks, and, and ha hit the boiler, and the boiler exploded and had multiple scald victims. Uh, don't quote me on the exact number, but I believe the ship had like 100, approximately 175 on board, and 135 were, um, were casualties and or fatalities. Um, and Red Rover will take 37. Now, some of you may say, hey, what, this happened on June 17th, and why did, they, why did it take two days, June 19th, to get admitted to this hospital? And I'll illustrate that for you at this time. Is that an ironclad? That was an ironclad? Yes. Well, yes, it was. That's a, there's the ship there. It's, a, it's an ironclad, and it went through the, through the deck and exploded the boiler. So the question for those that um, remotely was, uh, was the Mount City an ironclad. So there's the White River or uh, where the, the St. Charles is at. And keep in mind, the Red Rover stayed on the Mississippi River. It did not want to have to sail up, follow its uh, uh, the, other, the combat ships, the gunboats, up, because it would have to turn around on its own at some point in time. And let's not put this ship into harm's way. So they kept it on the Mississippi River. That distance there was 57 nautical miles. Those, these rivers, once you get past, uh, once you get south of island number 10, the Mississippi River come, becomes quite torturous. A lot of turns. Likewise, the White River, the Arkansas River, quite torturous. So where St. Charles is at, 57 nautical miles to get to the mouth of the, the, the confluence there at the Mississippi. If you were to draw a straight line, it's just 30. So this, they're, they're, a lot of turns, and so hence, again, 57 miles. If that sh if the ship is traveling five miles per hour, that's 10 hours. That's a 10-hour trip to from uh, from St. Charles down to put these men on board Red Rover. So that's why it took two days. They had they they had the event, uh, the battle there, and then they had to get them out of the water. There's still uh, hostilities going on. 
and they had the ships had to get turned around. A lot of logistics there uh, on why that happened. Keep in mind, folks, during tonight's presentation, keep reminding yourself that the Union owned the water on the Mississippi. They did not own the land on the either side. Yeah, they had control of Memphis. They did not have any control any uh, on the banks of Arkansas, nor the rest of Tennessee, certainly not Mississippi. Uh, likewise, Louisiana. So they own the water. They do not own the banks on either side. So there was a lot of hostilities. Uh, and they had to be very careful. Red Rover rarely ventured up and down the Mississippi on its own. Usually it had an escort, um, a destroyer, if you will, to uh, keep uh, hostilities at bay, despite being a hot, recognized as a hospital ship. And keep in mind, it had a, uh, armament on its bow. So then Red Rover will sail to, sails up to Memphis. And it had 37 critically ill sailors aboard, scald victims, you know, burns, a lot of pain. I'm confident that the, they received excellent care, probably a lot of, uh, in addition to burn care, wound care, uh, they administered, would have been administered laudanum, which is liquid opium uh, for pain. But they needed some help because then they were going to sail on to uh, Mount City to take, drop them off at the hospital there at Mount City. And they needed additional help. So they actually, when they got to Memphis, the rest of the flotilla was there. And they put the call one out for nurses, this would be men, from the mortar boats belonging to the flotilla to come aboard and help care for the injured on board Red Rover. When the ship arrived there on June 20th, and that um, from that White River up to Memphis is 180 miles. Again, it's going north, so it's going against the current, but even at 10 miles per hour, which it could not do, that's an 18-hour trip from that point right there up to Memphis is 18 hours. And, and, that's, and it had to be more than that because they're going against the current and that's at top speed. While they were there in Memphis get, picking up supplies and these nurses from the mortar ship, Sister Mary Angela, she's the mother of the sisters of that immaculate, uh, of, the Holy, of Holy Cross. And she sees this delightful little ship. And she probably also saw it because it was her sisters, her nuns, that started the hospital there at Mound City. So she probably saw this delightful little ship, and she offered her the, the nuns' services uh, on board the ship. And she wired, uh, she wired the powers to be up at Cairo and asked for this to take place, and she will be granted that. Uh, the Red Rover will leave. Memphis and sail up to Mound City, arriving there on June 26. It does not take seven days to travel, June 26th from or not uh, June 19th to June 26th. But keep in mind they had to get uh, nurses aboard from the mortar fleet, get supplies, try and uh, help out, uh, um, pick up additional patients there at, at the Memphis Hospital to take them to Mound City, and there were some so there's some logistics involved with that. From Memphis to Mound City Hospital is, at top speed, a 26-hour journey. So it's going to take them a full day. So they arrived at Mound City on the 26th, which tells me they either left late on the 24th or very early on the 25th. Again, another delightful picture of the starboard side. Amazes me we don't have pictures of the port side. So the sister, a little bit about the Sisters of the Holy Cross. Again, is they're out of uh, St. Mary Immaculate Conception at Notre Dame. And they opened that Mount City Hospital there in the fall of 1861. So it had already been in operation for uh, six, uh, six, nine months uh, when, before Red Rover was put to, put to water. And the sisters also, as I mentioned, started the hospital there at Memphis. Uh, they also started one at Cairo, Paducah, uh, Louisville, and even Washington City. These sisters were educators. 
They had no medical education, no nursing education whatsoever, and then they volunteered their services uh, for work in the hospital and on Red Rover. Sister uh, An uh, Mary Angela put the call out uh, three times to offer their services to these hospitals and or Red Rover, and after the third one, uh, by the time that was happened, they had uh, 65 of the 160 nurses uh, volunteered their services, of which eight will serve aboard Red Rover, one will serve its entire uh, lifetime uh, um, on, on the ship. And I'll identify her momentarily. So there's Sister Mary Angela. Um, it was mentioned that the nurse, or excuse me, the sisters received 50 cents a day, 10 cents more than Army nurses. Each sister also received a military pension, which helped pay for Bertrand Hall, pictured there. Now the Congregation's Administration Building at St. Mary's, and I'm happy to report that building still stands today. At the end of September of 1862, the Western Gunboat Flotilla and Mortar Fleet ceases to exist. Um, in name only. Uh, the ships that were uh, deemed um, viable and worthy to continue, including Red Rover, uh, now belong to the U.S. Navy. So that when you read about the Western Gunboat Flotilla, if you were to pick up uh, something and you, you want to read about some, uh, things that happened on the brown water, you, any time after um, October 1st of 62, you will not find the language Western Gunboat Flotilla. You'll see Mississippi River Squadron. But, uh, so at the end of September, so from June, July, August, September, those four months, Red Rover will admit 374 patients, uh, tout a survival rate of 90%, totaling uh, uh, just under 10,000 sick days, medical expenses only, uh, just uh, short of $3,500. So for October, November, December, the ship is getting fitted out. Uh, keep in mind it's mechanical, so things break down, they need to have repairs. Also, it needs to get winterized uh, to be able to sail up and down the Mississippi River during the, during the winter months, so that's why there's a little bit of a delay there. Plus, keep in mind the photos, the pictures that you have seen where it says USN Hospital, USN, United States Navy. Thus, all the photo, we do not have a photo of Red Rover while it would belong to the Western Gunboat Flotilla because it would not have, not have said USN. Um, so serving aboard the ship is you, uh, sisters Mary Adela, Mary Veronica, Mary Callista, sisters Mary Josephine, Mary Francis of Paula, Mary John of the Cross, Mary uh, Anetheus, and Mary Victoria. It would be Sister Adela who would serve the entire time uh, while it was part of the Western Gunboat Flotilla and also the Navy, uh, joining her for m most of the time is Veronica and uh, sisters Veronica and Callista. They all had to take the first name of Mary, and then they picked their own uh, name after that and dropped their lay, their lay last name. What, uh, Red Rover gets uh, some accolades again in the Harper's Weekly, May 9th of 1863. This institution, under the charge of Surgeon George Bixby and Dr. Hopkins, is an untold comfort to our sick or wounded uh, sailors. The sketch shows the main ward in which are accommodations for over 200 patients. The sister is one of those good women whose angelic services have been sung by poets and breathed by grateful convalescents all the world over. The convalescents are uh, placed in a ward for their sole use where they smoke, read, generally enjoy themselves. The boat itself, a clean, roomy craft, is under the gallant command of a gallant, or under the command of a gallant old soldier. There will be some missions for which Red Rover will partake as a naval ship uh, now on the part of that um, Mississippi River Squadron. Um, they will have uh, an event at Napoleon, Arkansas, or um, meet up at Napoleon, Arkansas. That's the confluence of uh, 
of the of a river here, the Ar at Arkansas. And on January uh, three days, January 9th, 10th, and 11th of '63, uh, the squad river squadron uh, will go and capture Fort Hindman, uh, and they will sustain some casualties, uh, for which Red Rover will pick those uh, meet them on the Mississippi River. It will start to sail south, and on January 22nd, again, keep in mind uh, they do not own the banks of the Mississippi. Uh, the ship will come, the uh, squadron, including Red Rover, will come under a rebel attack, and two shots will penetrate the hospital itself. Red Rover sailors return fire with their small arms. Again, they do not fire the 32-pound uh, gun from the bow. And it will sail on down uh, to the Yazoo River, which is just north of Vicksburg, and uh, arriving there on January 23rd, uh, where they will pick up um, injured and sick from Porter's uh, Mississippi River Squadron. Again, now you keep in mind the, um, the events and the coming events to try and take Vicksburg are now underway and it will take several months for Vicksburg to fall. Uh, so there on the, right, on the left is uh, the Arkansas River. You can see just how torturous it is, and even the uh, Mississippi River, how torturous that is. Uh, the red arrow there on the, uh, for the left picture is the, uh, where Red Rover will pick up the injured uh, from uh, Fort Hindman. And on the right there, it's a little bit of a blow up showing you uh, where the Fort Hyman in Arkansas is at in relationship to where Red Rover would be stationed there at Napoleon. Red Rover uh, will be instrumental in standing guard, uh, caring for the wounded uh, from the siege of Vicksburg. And it will arrive on April 16th of 63, uh, and by the time Vicksburg falls on July 3rd of 63, um, Sister Mary Adela will even make note that, uh, that she could hear the, the shelling uh, from Vicksburg. That's how close they were uh, at, at the time. Red Rover will also, during that time, during those months, uh, during that siege of Vicksburg, will be sailing up and down uh, between from the Yazoo River, basically from Vicksburg on up to Mississippi, traveling up and down, delivering medical supplies, delivering ice, uh, delivering uh, meat because of the, what's able to haul on the first deck. It will also the sailors will also bury the wound, uh, the the the, de the deceased on the banks of the Mississippi. Union soldiers who died are buried on the banks of the Mississippi, and it's Red Rover that does the, the sailors that, on the Red Rover that do that. <clears throat> once uh, once um, Vicksburg falls, uh, Red Rover will turn around on the 3rd and again sail up, arriving in Memphis on the 14th and picking up more medical supplies. And now it has f uh, uh, free passage to get past Vicksburg and will deliver supplies uh, to Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana which is about 30 miles south, nautical miles south of uh, Port Hudson. Uh, there's Port Hudson there. So there's Vicksburg. It sails north, uh, picks up medical supplies at Memphis, and now comes down past the 30 miles, nautical miles past uh, Port Hudson. From Memphis to Baton Rouge, it's 685 <laughs> nautical miles. So that's that's a 70-hour, that's a three-day journey. And that's without picking up additional coal. You know, that's at top speed, and if, at nighttime it can't go top speed. You know, they need to slow down, otherwise they're going to run aground because the tortuousness of the, uh, of the river. So keep that in mind. And then they also have to stop and pick up coal. Also, Red Rover gets orders every now and then. How does it get orders? Well, certainly there's no signal flares per se, no Morse code. So they have to, they get flagged down and stop and receive telegrams from various cities, Mount City, or, uh, Mount City to Memphis, uh, 
and now Vicksburg. Um, why, so they had to get wired messages. Uh, on the right there, there's the Yazoo River. So Red Rover is sitting there. Uh, Vicksburg there on the right. And I hope you can appreciate why it took so many months for Vicksburg to fall. Uh, because when the gunboats were coming around, they had to slow down dramatically to make that curve to go south. And Vicksburg, sitting up on a hill, was able to lay waste to them from their artillery. And the gunboats firing from the water, gravity was working against them. And those, uh, they did not pack much of a, have much, of, much effect early on um, because they could not get close enough to fire their weapons. Likewise, uh, ships coming... Uh, from the south uh, were easily spotted uh, from a gr far distance, and hence why it took so long for Vicksburg to fall. Uh, somewhere in here is where Grant's trying to cut that canal, basically just to circumnavigate nav around and bypass Vicksburg. Some of you may be aware of the massacre at Fort Pillow. Uh, you can see the photo of it there on the uh, eastern side of the banks of uh, Mississippi again, the Confederacy held the ground. Um, Union forces held the water. Uh, there was a, a massacre at Fort Pillow. Uh, Red Rover was sailing down on a routine journey. Uh, it left Cairo on April 11th, and some way, somehow, they get orders to uh, expedite and pick up injured at Fort Pillow, they will arrive two days later on the 13th, picking up 13 wounded and then sailing on down uh, to Mississippi. Uh, from Fort Pillow to, uh, or excuse me, sail on down to Memphis, my errors. From Fort Pillow to Memphis is 70 nautical miles, so at top speed, that's, t that's a seven hour journey. Uh, from there to there. Here's our surgeons uh, aboard. Uh, number uh, seated at the far left, that is Surgeon Bixby. Uh, number one, he's a surgeon. Number two, he's a paymaster, so everybody gets paid. Uh, interestingly, there is a civilian who gets, make, gets placed in this photo. He's not identified as number three. Uh, his name's George Lawrence, but I do not know uh, what contribution he had to the ship. Um, these other surgeons here, uh, the gentleman on the uh, seated uh, third from the left is uh, Fleet Surgeon Pickney, and he will make Red Rover his flagship. Uh, so I, I told you that the Red Rover will have six additional surgeons, so eight, eight total. So in this photo is one, two, three, four, uh, five, five of the eight. And that this also tells me that Two of the surgeons, uh, or at least one of them, is coming and going um, because uh, at most they had uh, four surgeons act on, on board during it uh, on, a, on a day. So this photo was taken, someone was uh, arriving, someone was leaving. Again, a nice starboard sh shot of our ship. Ann Bradford. Ann Bradford is an African-American woman. And uh, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells said, this is not right. And he mentioned that persons of color commonly known as contraband, it is not proper that they should be compelled to render necessary and regular service without a stated compens compensation. Hence, going forward, uh, these individuals would be paid $10 per month with one ration per day. On January 25th of 1863, Anne, Anne uh, Bradford was on USS Red Rover roster, and she was under the title of contraband. On June uh, 1st of 64 through October 25th of 64, she now has the title of nurse. She will also meet aboard a gentleman by the name of Gilbert Stokes, and after the war, they will get married. She will outlive him. And after the war, many people would uh, constantly go up to Ann Bradford and say, you need to apply for a pension. You are entitled to a pension. And she would say, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. 
Well, one, she was illiterate, so she was not able to fill out that application. Finally, some people helped her fill out that application. She applied for such and was granted a pension in 1890. Going forward, she received uh, $12 per month, and the same that was awarded to nurses uh, during the Civil War. Other women working aboard uh, Red Rover had the title of uh, nurse or contraband, laundress, sister of charity. All their dates varied. Uh, and sister, again, Sister Mary Adela, uh, while under the uh, title of U.S. Navy ship Red Rover, uh, she will be there again from the day, uh, day after Christmas, December of 62, uh, through its lifetime. August of 1865. I realized the, the war had ended by now, but Red Rover will transport wounded sailors back home and sail up and down the Mississippi trying to um, get people uh, home. So those that had the title of nurse, in addition to Ann Bradford, Ellen Campbell, Georgiana Harris, Sarah Nothing, Sarah Kino, Alice Kennedy, Betsy Young and Dennis Downs. Ship received several acc accolades. The Red Rover was fitted with every comfort, and poor Jack, when sick and wounded, was cared for in a style never before dreamed of in the Navy. Brown Water Admiral David D. Porter. One of the largest and most beautiful steamers on the Mississippi with splendid accommodations for the sick. Finally, there is a port side of the ship. It does exist. And there's the side, the other wheel. Uh, I hope you can appreciate there that deck where uh, the cattle and poultry would be there. Again, sailing up and down. Uh, the Mississippi delivering uh, meat as well as medical supplies and the hospital located right there at the top deck. So in summary, this, uh, the USS Red Rover operated from June of 1862 through November of 1865. Again, uh, during the summer and fall uh, in the autumn of 65, transporting and trying to get sailors home, or uh, the infantry home uh, from the from the, from the uh, war. It had an average daily census of about 50, so any given day there would be 50 patients. The norm was somewhere between 75 and 100. So from June 11th of 1862 through March of 1865, Red Rover admitted just under 1,700 patients, touting a survival rate of 93%. Uh, from April of 1865 to November 17th of 65, trying to get people home, uh, just under 800, and as a result, in 1908, the United States Navy uh, Nurse Corps was established. Uh, maybe somebody can help me out. Um, you're not going to be able to help me out right now, because I would share the information if I had it. I would like to find, I'm trying to find out where Red Rover was on April 7th, of 1865. What's significant about that date? April 7th of 1865. That's the Sultana explosion on the seven miles north of Memphis. I'm trying to find out where Red Rover was at on that fateful night. I do know that Sister Mary Adela was on board the last day of service, or excuse me, um, was on board um, shoot, where's it at here? My apologies. Oh, her last uh, recorded employment on the, uh, on the ship was dated April 30th, 1865. And that's Sister Mary Adela. So it's, I do know that the ship is on the water April 30th. I've got to figure it's on the water certainly somewhere April 7th. Um, 
So Red Rover is certainly a hospital first. I hope you can appreciate that uh, after tonight's presentation. It was the first U.S. ship with medical doctors on board. It was the first Navy hospital ship. It was the first ship to allow nuns to serve. It was the first ship to employ and pay female civilians. It was the first ship to employ and pay African Americans. Uh, a couple things, if I can go back for one moment. That survival rate of 93%, when I first saw that, I was amazed. I think many in the audience and at home are amazed as well. And then my medical knowledge kicked in a little bit. Keep in mind, if a soldier or a sailor took a bullet to the chest, he's not going to make it aboard Red Rover and as a viable patient. So anyone that died on the battlefield is not going to be on Red Rover. So you got to get, they had to get to the, from the battlefield or from ships to be placed on Red Rover. They had to be alive when they got there. And they had to have reasonable expectation that they would survive. So while the 93% rate is very impressive, and I do not discount that whatsoever, uh, keep in mind that people had to be, uh, uh, the ability, what they would feel would be, survive their injuries or illnesses. Uh, but it is great non nonetheless. And occasionally I do found, stumble across names, um, first name, last name of people who died that were patients aboard Red Rover that died, that, in court, that make up that 7%. Uh, as a result, uh, U.S. Navy's first hospital ship after Red Rover uh, in modern day is the, was known, at, had the title, the name Relief. And today, sailing on the Blue Waters uh, are United States Navy ship Comfort and Mercy. Also, the Veterans Administration, Great Lakes, Illinois. Uh, there's a building named after, in honor of Red Rover. So I hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. USS Red Rover, a hospital first. Again, for those joining us remotely, there's my contact information. If you want, uh, I can certainly email you or put it in postal mail. Uh, tonight's abstract and or the bibliography if you request that. Uh, and just jot down my cell number and or email and get a hold and contact me that way. Uh, raise your hand if you learned just one thing tonight. <laughs> I appreciate the, uh, the uh, ability to come and share uh, my research with you. I look forward to, uh, as I said, I have four other presentations. I do not have any books published, but I do have publications and journals uh, I'm working on Red Rover right now, and maybe you can read about all those details. The biggest one I need to find out is where Red Rover was at on August, or excuse me, April 7th of 65. Again, I appreciate uh, the uh, attendance. I'll certainly entertain any questions at this time. Thank you for your attention. Yes? Was it considered um, a plush? I mean, if I were a naval uh, sailor, would I want to work on one of these hospital ships? Was it considered a negative job or a positive job? Uh, so for those in uh, remotely, the question was, would this be a desirable occupation to work on this vessel? I do know that there was one, uh, Surgeon Pickney made it his flagship. I do know that there was an appreciation for the significance of this ship and the contributions that people were able to make. Um, Bix, the, the, the surgeons, those acting assistant surgeons, again, they come from civilian life. Bixby served four years aboard that ship from 60, June of 62 through 65, through the fall of 65, uh, so three years. Um, so I believe, yes, they, they uh, welcomed it with open arms and were grateful for the contributions they were able to make and the accommodations for which the ship provided and 
to facilitate uh, incorporate uh, better care. Other questions? Any questions from uh, remotely as well? Sir? Yeah, Mark, uh, actually two questions. First question is, um, how did the ship distinguish itself as a hospital ship? I was thinking of that question during the presentation. At the end, you showed the cup of birth, and the birth, you know, obviously, very well uh, distinguished the white. The white. How did it distinguish itself during the Civil War as a hospital ship to the Confederate Army Navy? And then also the second, um, well, the second question would be where it got its name from. But uh, yeah, so that's a three-part question. The first part, um, when the uh, Red Rover Gannon was built in 1859, uh, uh, it was originally a merchant ship, and whoever gave it the, the name, uh, the Confederacy just kept it Red, kept it Red Rover, and uh, same thing with the Federal Forces, just kept the, the name the same. Uh, question number two was how did they identify the ship? It was not identified outside of when it became part of the Navy in uh, September, or excuse me, October, uh, October 1st of uh, 62. Um, sometime during that September, or October, November, December is when they painted the USN and said hospital on it to identify it. Prior to that, it was not identified when it was under the Western Gunboat Flotilla as a hospital. And keep in mind, the Confederacy sit on those banks of that Mississippi, they see a 32 pound gun on its bow. You know, um, so, and prior to that, there was no um, big, you know, it's like, hey, this is, this is a non-combat ship. And you can actually, I hope you can appreciate that. It does not say United States ship comfort mercy. It says United States naval ship. So it's not a warship. Uh, no armament on this. Uh, interesting too. We have we have port side photos of both of these things. Um, uh, you, you had one more question. No, those are the two. Okay, thank you very good, sir. What happened to it? Excellent point. Thank you for that segue. Um, it, like all naval ships after the war, they were sold. It was sold for scrap, and uh, that happened in. Uh, so its last day was. Um, uh, its last day of service was uh, November 17th of 65, and within 13 days it was sold for scrap. Uh, they d broke it all apart, yeah, sold for scrap. Um, I know the, the dollar amount, it, it was a couple thousand dollars. Uh, I would love to have that bell. I don't know if you could ever, anybody ever saw the bell on that ship? Just the magnificent, uh, uh, oh, there it is right there. Made a ship yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yes, sir. Why does that surprise anybody? What do you think is going to happen to the USS Enterprise? Very good. So the question is, it should not come as a surprise to those in the audience that the ships, when they were, they were basically sold and and then scrapped out, and the same happens with the Navy, uh, the United States Navy today. Occasionally, there are. Uh, some vessels uh, that are named after states like um, the New Jersey, for example, that battleship. Um, it's sitting at New Jersey. And, but even like the aircraft carrier, the Intrepid, uh, sitting in New York Harbor, you know, it's, it's just, it's there. It's a tourist attraction, but it's, you know, it's rusting away. And then it, there's a lot of monies that need to be dedicated to uh, keep it fitted and viable, so yeah, they do rust uh, very rapidly. But weren't steamboats actually used out in the river for yeah. uh, a number of years after that? So the question is, hey, weren't there steamboats used and uh, on the river? And the answer is yes, uh, sailing up and down for passengers and uh, as well as also commerce. Uh, in fact, uh, one can, uh, the, um, forget the name, um, uh, that uh, I was thinking, uh, there, even to this day, you could take go to Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, it's Queen something, the, the Delta Queen, and ride down ride the Delta Queen uh, and take an excursion on the Mississippi River, um, sail uh, sail from the Ohio from Miss, um, Cincinnati and sail on down, um, on the panel. It's a paddle wheel. Very good. Yes. Was it built in the North? Uh, yeah, it, uh, the Red Rover, it was built at, uh, at Cape Girard. 
Cape Girard, uh, ironically, and uh, but then its its home base was in New Orleans. Any other questions or any questions from uh, those our colleagues remotely? <laughs> 